Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands vlog and podcast. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm joined today by Gary Heitman. Gary, welcome. Great to have you today. Thank you very much indeed. Glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, Gary has 34 years experience in the M&E industry with a mixed background of design and contracting. He started as an apprentice at Howe Engineering Services in 1988 as a technical apprentice and moved to a consultancy called Jeffrey Wilkinson, latterly acquired by WSP. He spent 13 years at NG Bailey, starting life as a senior designer and progressed to operations director in the Midlands in 2004, with a revenue of £15 million, growing to £35 million revenue, securing projects like BCU and the New Street Gateway. After that, he spent 10 years at Lawn Stewart PLC, as the National Pre-Construction Director and Group Engineering Director. He joined the board of Lawn Stewart in 2017, worked on high-end residential schemes in London, such as Centrepoint Tower and Sky Studios in Boreham Wood, with a value of 52 million. He moved to the JRL Group in the Midlands as a director of the M&E arm, ARC, Mechanical and Electrical, uh, working on the Octagon, one east side, 49 and 50 storey residential towers, um, Bioma Quarter, do I pronounce that right? That is correct. Uh, which was £70 million worth of M&E projects across three sites. He was attracted to the JRL Group and, and ARC as, uh, by the fresh integrated construction model, more of which to follow. Uh, he went through a traditional training route of ONC, HNC, uh, and CED day release in building services, and in 1988, 1998, sorry, secured incorporated engineer and a SIBSI. Most recently, in 2021, he became a member of the Institution of Engineers and Technology, the IET, and most recently, he's become a chartered engineer and M SIBSI. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. A uh, bit of an achievement. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And it was quite a weird one, really, leaving it that late in the career, but it's never too late. Well, the, the whole time we've known each other, you've always been a Sibsy I eng and uh, it's always been sort of on my mind to, uh, you know, see whether there's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we can do, you can do what you want to do to uh, uh, change that. But uh, what, what uh, prompted that? Um, I think um, it, it was basically a, a conversation that I had with um, a member of the committee that told me about the experiential learning room, um, and I wasn't familiar that it was that it was there as an opportunity. Um, and reading up on that, I thought that that was the ideal route for me, given the fact that um, I haven't got a master's degree. Um, yeah. And, and 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 34 years in the industry. So um, I had some good coaching and mentoring actually in, in terms of, of of putting the pack together, which comprised of two documents, the experiential learning report and the engineering practice report. Um, and then obviously the prep for the for the interview. And and it was a it was a result really of lockdown um, and and thinking of ways to to stimulate my, my mind and and to increase my own accreditation and I, and I think it is vitally important that you you know you just carry more credence you carry more professionalism with the accreditation you know when I'm dealing with with people every day on the other side of the table I'm, I'm obviously contractor side I deal with consultants and and I think you just gain you gain more respect by by having the the CNG. Uh, title, so uh, after your name. Yeah, absolutely. It does matter. It does matter. Yeah. Uh, but so, um, yeah, yeah a, a bit of time available in uh, COVID, so uh, got down to to writing a report. And um, may I ask who your uh, sponsors and and uh, supporting people were? Anybody that you'd like to recognise? Yeah, Simon, Simon Waldron. You know, I, I owe a lot of thanks to Simon. He he obviously told me about the uh, experiential learning room. Um, and I had a couple of sessions with him as well, just in terms of, of, of the best way to present the information, um, which was invaluable. You know, that, that little bit of coaching was, was great. Being on the contractor side rather than being on the consultancy side is, is, is something that, um, you know, I, I was quite nervous, you know, thinking, how am I going to achieve all the 18 competencies when I don't do design? But 
they're not all about design anyway. So it's in context of what you do in your day job and in context of, of how you can create a, a response that fulfills the criteria. But but you know, in maybe even in a managerial role rather than you know an overseeing role rather than actually doing some of some of that stuff. But uh, it it was really, really useful from from Simon. Yeah, vitally important to have that sort of uh, guiding uh, influence on on the application process. But uh, I too followed that uh, mature candidate route, as it were. Uh, and uh, as it happened, Simon was one of the interviewers for me to become member as well. I, I still remember it to this day. But uh, yeah, Simon's at Urban Jungle now. He is, yeah. He is, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but really you... useful having. Sorry, go on. It's, it's quite quite interesting because. Um, in my career, I've, I've I've stood in front of a few people and pitched for some big tenders and whatever. But for the interview, I was really nervous, um, and I, I I don't know why, but uh, quite bizarre. And there was two guys on the other side of the the panel that uh, were way more experienced than I was, but um, they were they were really friendly, and uh, it was it was a really good conversation. They were quite interactive, so it's yeah. it's good experience. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, it's not about being proficient in health and safety or in procurement or in design. Or it, that what, what they're looking for is a well-rounded individual with experience in most, if not all, of the fields. But it's not necessarily that you have to be the expert in all of them, but you just can't be uh, n lack of, uh, you know, no knowledge in any one of the fields. So, you know, as long as you're a, a well-rounded individual, which you are, uh, you know, the, and uh, there is the opportunity for those that don't, as you say, have the, the the bachelor's, the three years bachelor's or the four years master's accredited degree to progress themselves and, and uh, get that accreditation, which is the outward sort of medal or badge of um, uh, to, to the industry. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example for that. You know, if 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 they were looking at um, energy or overheating or modelling or something like that, you know, I I I've, I wouldn't know where to start in producing a TM59 model, but I can certainly sit down with a pair of designers that do and have that conversation and interrogate the results and challenge the results and you know why why are the results like this and, and how what how about if we do that? What if we do this? It's that sort of thing, and then, and then putting that into the report is enough uh, to say that you, you you understand that part of the process of, of a project. Yeah, you you don't necessarily need to be able to uh, calculate U values from first principles to be able to yeah. to, to get that uh, CNG MCBZ yeah. level. Um, but uh, yeah, ha having the knowledge of the, what the difference is between a Bruckel and an SBEM and a um, DEC and uh, SAP calculations and, and all those sorts of things, you know, it's, it's having that understanding and familiarisation and experience rather than being the, the expert. It was 30 years ago when I learned about solar azimuth. <laughs> so uh, yeah, a long, long time ago. But uh, it sounds as though we're, we're very similar in that we take great satisfaction in in that. I, too, was was extremely nervous when I came to do the presentation and coming out the other side, I thought to myself, I've done as best as I can there. And if I've passed, I've passed. If I failed, I failed. I'll, I'll probably go again for it. Um, but yeah, presenting to two industry peers and uh, them saying, yeah, you're at that level, you, you do come out of it when you get the, the acknowledgement and the certificate of, uh, yeah, I, I am where I think I am and uh, I'm really happy with my performance sort of thing. Proud, proud moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Very proud. Um, it's something that I always looked at thinking, I'd, I'd love that to see it. I'd love that. You know, and um, to actually get there, it was it was a it was a proud moment. There's no doubt. I so think from the from the process and the experience, though, just I, I would say that um, the two reports that you produce, one of them is a, an elaborate CV, effectively the experiential learning route of your career, um, and the other one is is the um, the the um, the competency report. There's a there's a lot of crossover between the two documents. Um, the competency report I wrote was project based, so when you actually write about a project, it's so easy to make make the story flow of what you did on that project and how it fits into the 
A1, C1, C3, those categories. It's quite simple to do. You just need to put time aside to think about what you achieved. It, when you get to the end and you look back and you read the reports, you think, my God, you know, there's, there's so much that you've been through in your career. There's so much that you've learned. Um, it's, it's quite phenomenal. It's quite phenomenal. But the, the biggest part of learning I would, I would share with people going down that route is, is the interview. And I, I thought I could have done better in the interview. And the reason being is the, the um, I think the panel are very keen to understand that you check off the 18 competencies. And a slide per competence would have made that a lot easier than what I did. And I presented on projects and I talked about the story of a project, but then that project only fulfilled five of the competencies and the next one did another five, and the next one did another five, and we were sort of jumping around a little bit. So, so tell me again how you achieved E1 on that slide. And whereas one slide per competency, I know it's quite binary and it probably be a bit less of a story when you're explaining the project. Um, it would have been a lot easier for the assessors just to have ticked off, yeah, A1's good, yeah, A2 is good, yeah, A3 is good. You know, so that's the only the, the, the biggest lesson I, I, I'd share. Yeah, I was thinking about that when we discussed it in the weeks leading up to this. And uh, I think you're right. It is very binary. And, you know, this is the question. This is the answer. And, the, you know, this is what you're trying to find out about me. And this is how I've done it. Um, and for me, I, I personally interview for MCBZ, CNG, IN, JCBZ, uh, EngTech, all those sorts of things. And I personally like it the way that you've done it, which is describing a project. And this demonstrates my competency in A1 and C1, you know, just a couple of them, because if you put all 18 against one example, then you can't tick all of the boxes in, in that regard. But I, I, I recognise that doing it as uh, the the alternative way, which is here's this competency that you're looking for me to demonstrate, and here's my uh, work based example. I think it's also interesting to uh, talk about the difference between the MCBZ element, which is the first part, and 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 the EPR or the, uh, the the other report that you mentioned, and then going on to do the CNG bit, which is slightly different competencies and criteria as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought the, the process was a challenge, and I, and I think if if it's equivalent to demonstrating that you've got a master's of learning, it has to be, doesn't it? You know, the, the, the Simpsons are can't just open the door to anybody to get chartered. It should be something that you you're proud to achieve, and you've got that experience, so you have to put the effort in. and And I think my my uh, the two reports were thirteen thousand words in total across the two documents. So. Yeah. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a lot of effort, but I think it has to be to demonstrate and, you're at that level. And presumably, with it being in COVID, there were a few Teams meetings and Zoom meetings and telephone calls rather than physical meetups with with Simon and, and other mentors and and guides and information. Yeah, there was a bit of both. A bit of both. We did actually physically meet up as well in in person, which was which was great. Like I say, I'm very grateful for that. And if and if somebody wanted to get some mentoring from me going forward, having gone through the process, no problem at all with that. I'd glad to share. Excellent. And uh, so how did you and Simon come about to start with? We worked on, on projects, so under uh, the launch to employment that uh, I had before, um, Simon had done some design for us, um, where Urban Jungle were, were doing the stage four, stage five on um, on a uh, humidity controlled warehouse for uh, storage of artifacts. Um, it was a seven million pound m and project and, and Simon did all the detailed design. Um, so we got we got closer, got closer from that. And he, he mentioned it in passing because uh, I was talking about CNG and, and my desires and I was quite thrilled to see that there was an alternative route rather than the, the academic route. And how did it compare to the uh, IET membership process? The IET membership process was only a detailed CV. So um, none of the competency criteria because that wasn't going for, for chartered. So um, that was, it. I could, I almost used that uh, when I produced the IET for my, um, for my uh, experiential learning report. So it was... And uh, 
just added so on to it to, to update it, presumably. Yeah, yeah. And could yeah. you have got CN through the IET as well? I, I believe so, but I didn't look into it. But um, it probably would have needed more effort in terms of doing a, more of a competency assessment, you know. Um, but um, I didn't look into it. I, I, once I, I, I knew about the Sibsey route, I, that was the route I preferred. Good. Excellent. Yeah, it's interesting seeing all of the different institutions that are out there and, and membership and subscription fees and uh, application forms and processes. And uh, yeah, depending on your, your speciality and uh, as you say, uh, the, the mechanical and electrical building services is, is so wide ranging that, uh, um, that there's uh, uh, areas for, for competency and to demonstrate your competency in, in all of them. Um, but yeah, with the uh, IET, IMECE, ICE, structural engineers, you know, we're, we're all engineers working in the industry with uh, our various specialties. Um, yeah. But no, yeah, it's, it's good. Um, so currently at uh, ARC, how, how are you settling in? Yes, yeah, so fantastic. The, um, I joined here in, in April um, and uh, started working on the high rise residential buildings in the Midlands because they'd secured the work up here. Um, it's very, very different um, because it's an integrated main contractor. Um, and I think, the, you know, the main driver for me joining was to try something fresh. Um, and, and the freshness of, of JRL Group was um, was very welcome. The fact that they you know, do um, they, they do uh, substructures, they do slip form structures, they do the facade, they do the M&E, they've got in-house architecture, in-house structural design, uh, dry lining, um, temps, um, environmental recycling. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is a real uh, one-stop shop uh, type, type approach. And, and the, 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 the main difference, uh, Joss, is that when you come to work um, in the morning and, and you, you sit down as part of that group, you feel part of that group. You don't feel like a subcontractor or a sub subcontractor. You feel part of that group. You have, a, you have a seat at the table with a client to influence decisions and you, you feel more, more listened to, you contribute more rather than being, you know, uh, pushed aside because you're a sub subcontractor. But, but the most important thing is the objective every day is about building the job and about improving the job and about the innovation that you can bring that, that, that means you're going to deliver quicker rather than um, walking onto a, a site as a subcontractor and you think, oh, it's not ready and the surveyors that might delay claims and things like that. And, you know, that, that will always be the case, and unfortunately, because contracts are contracts and things go wrong. But the objective in, in JRL is all about getting the job built quicker, getting the job built easier, working together in a collaborative environment. You know, we can't claim against the main contractor if he's in delay. We've, it's our brother and sister, for goodness sake. So the focus is about if they're in trouble, what can we do to help? Can we speed up? You know, um, And uh, the, the objective is very, very different. It's a yeah. far more collaborative environment. And it's not just about uh, reducing the cost for your cost centre, because as you say, you're part of an overall group whose uh, one desire and focus is to, to build the building, build it better as a group. So it's not just about, uh, you know, one P&L account uh, uh, being improved. It's about the overall group uh, performance. And as you say, uh, you know, um, resequencing the the installation of the, the the cables or the pipe work in certain areas for the benefit of the group overall uh is to get the building built uh yeah it's, uh, and, it, and to the benefit of the client you know if if, if you have a, a job that has major challenges and, and goes into claim scenarios then the client's not going to get the end result that he wanted that he expected because you know, people will be on tight costs and, and, and cut corners and, and the dispute will reflect, I think, in the in the end product. The 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 um the model with JRO is that our involvement as as M and E is is extremely early. You know, we're we they're not worried about particularly the procurement process of going out and getting three quotes for the M and E 
and, and taking that time to evaluate those quotes, getting a contract set up. It's just straight away, as soon as JRL have, have won the job and we've quoted it together, you, you're in. So our focus straight away is, okay, what we're going to prefabricate? What what can we engineer? You know, how, how are we going to set this building up so so it, it, it is more of a of a of a of a process than it is of, of a subcontracting entity? So it, it, the mindset's very different. How early is early? Concept stage, detailed design stage. No, in, because it's uh, tendered as design build, most of it's design build, it, it, it is in that traditional way. But if, if you think of a traditional uh, approach where a main contractor secures the order, he'll focus on his immediate packages first. So he'll, he'll want to get his groundworks done. He'll want to get the piling package done. He'll want to get his, his concrete frame sorted and, and then his facade. And eventually he'll get to the M&E and the M&E will come to the, the top of the pile Whereas we're, we're already there, you know, on day one, we're already there. So we're, we're talking to our own facade contractor, we're talking to our own concrete contractor in-house, we're, we're talking about this is what we need for builders' work, this is what we need for louver penetrations, you know, we're, we're getting into, into the level of detail so early that it forces you to engineer the job better. And uh, can you talk about any of the projects in West Midlands region that you've got on currently? Yeah, so um, Octagon um, is a build to rent um, high rise residential um, complex on the Paradise development. That's a 49 storey tower, 370 uh, bedrooms. Um, the, uh, the project is uh, an all electric um, solution for the building. So there's, there is no gas supply, there are no boilers, no CHPs. Um, so we've got incoming boosted cold water risers, sprinkler systems, smoke vent systems. Um, quite challenging because it's a single staircase building over that, that quantum of levels with eight to ten apartments per floor, depending on where you are in, in the building. Not so. So, yeah, four. four um, sorry, three lifts, two of them are, are firefighting, one evacuation, um, and uh, sprinklers, sprinklers throughout. Um, so yeah, the, the fire strategy was extremely detailed. And, and it, again, the beauty of the early involvement is we were bringing sprinkler contractors, smoke vent contractors to the table straight away um, to talk about the configuration of those CDPs and get the CDPs moving. And, and that yeah. smoke vent is to to um, remove smoke from any given area uh, in the event of a fire, and and the sprinklers obviously put the fire out. It is, it is yeah. So the first the first point uh, of of um, of issue in in the lobby um, is the smoke vent will pick it up, and the fire alarm will will sense that, and that then generates the smoke extract fans. Um, which uh, the, the modulation dampers open on the fire floor um, and you've got their natural AOV inlets on the staircases, you've got natural AOV inlets to the lobby and you keep the lobby clear by, um, that firefighting lobby clear by the smoke extract system okay. and it enables the firefighters to go to the, to the fire floor or go via the staircase one level up, come back down. Um, there's, there's dual outlet um wet riser valves on every level so they can put two they can put two hoses on um uh, so yeah it's quite uh, it's quite intense the fire strategy as you can imagine after grenfell the focus on the cladding the focus on the fire sy systems and life safety is is paramount so we have a lot of meetings with with bco and the fire strategies to get it right um bco's building control officer yeah 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 it is yeah um, yeah. So uh, with it being an all electric building, that's going to be one hell of a um, power supply and power requirement for, for 300 and something odd uh, beds, did you say? Yeah, 370. So yeah, the, um, we've got um, incoming um, HV, we've got two um, LV switch rooms, primary and secondary. So we've got ATSs and backup supplies for all the life safety systems. Um, the idea now are bringing the power into the apartments and going up the risers and running those directly to each of the apartments. And we've got electric 
hot water generators, um, MVHR um, for the uh, ventilation for the apartments in line with the, the TM59 model. And we've, we've got um, electric heaters, um, Wi-Fi controlled electric heaters in the apartments. So and this is this is built to rent, so none of it's for sale. So. And your interest is both the mechanical and the electrical uh, pipes and wires building services? Yeah, absolutely. My background is mechanical as a as a bias, but um, over oversee that. But we, you know, we employ project managers, supervisors to to deliver um, to deliver the uh, the M and A on on site. There's been a, a hell of a lot of work in terms of prefabrication of of stacks. I've got one thousand three hundred fifty stacks on the job. We're using Gebrit Super Tube solution, so we've got no separate vent. So that's quite challenging. That's what these these images are behind me. These these this, the stack here. So looking at the casting solution for those, it's a it's a sewn um, joint that's uh, at the bottom of the stack on every level with expansion and getting that low enough, getting to get the shower drain connection on. There's a there's a specific Hilti fire collar that's been developed so you can sink that joint into the slab and get the shower connection as low as possible. So all that sort of stuff that you're engineering now before we before we start on site is really, really interesting and really beneficial. At um, Lawns, I know you had uh, some sister groups of companies uh, that, that did some prefabricated services. Is that the same with uh, ARC and JRL? You've got uh, um, sister companies there? Yeah, so uh, Caledonia Modular is part of the JRL group. It was a, uh, an acquisition a few months ago. Um, and we're using Caledonia Modular to prefabricate the utility cupboards. So the um, the incoming uh, IDNO meter board is in is in there. The MVHR is in there. The consumer units in there. The grid switch for the kitchens uh, and the appliances is in there. Hot water cylinder, space for the washing machine, and that's all in in a in a uh, prefabricated steel frame, steel plated, powder coated finished solution. So those are being made up in Newark um, and they'll they'll be coming down four at a time for for each of the floor plates as we go up. And they get what lifted into position via a dirty great big crane and then slide slid in through the side of the building. They are they are two tower cranes on the project. Um, because of the facade being uh, fitted by tower crane that takes up a lot of time second tower crane so the the solution which is quite unique to to jrl is that, that once the the ground floor slabs there the columns are precast the slab is precast um but trim precast in nottingham um once once the the slab and the columns are there the bathroom pods are, are prefabricated the, the utility cupboards are prefabricated they get craned in and then you put a precast slab on top of them Okay. And then you keep going and going and going. So, but there's a there's quite another unique bit of innovation that's uh, occurring at uh, Octagon, and that that is um, a prefabricated wall for the apartments. So, these are like 600 wide tongue and groove panels, um, either 75 or 100 mil thick, or double skin for party walls, and those have been palletized, sent to site. They've already got conduit ways through there they're already routed with the back boxes routed for the conduit entry so when the wall goes up it's ready to just wire and we've spent spent hours and hours and hours with trim precast going through literally a one bedroom apartment and if there's 60 panels in a one bedroom apartment that's a type one that's a type two that's a type three and those have got ebony interfaces with them whether it's a simple sprinkler hole in the top or a light switch uh, back box routed position, cable route through. So that, that's been a hell of a lot of work. But once they go in and they're erected on site and our, and our sparks go in and our pipe fitters go in, the apartment is literally constructed and ready for first fix, even to the point where light fittings are, are spotted and sprayed on the floor, sprinkler heads are sprayed on the floor. So an engineer has actually gone in to that apartment and got it ready for the for the M&E to start. And this is all about improving the productivity on site and improving the program and making it more of a production line type type 
principle rather than walking in and saying, well, that section of dry lining is not there because the dry lining was on a price and it's stuck to the facade. That wall is done. The QA procedure means that that apartment is constructed and it's ready for us to go. Yeah. So and, it, it and, makes the productivity so much better. And safer as well, having uh, cleaner conditions maybe in uh, in a prefabricated workshop uh, off-site. Yes, there's the element of transportation from where it's been uh, prefabricated to get it to site, but uh, by by prefabricating it, you get it constructed uh, uh, hopefully a lot closer to the the, the theoretical design. Um, and then, yeah, as you say, it's a, a, a well, you didn't say, sorry, but it, it might be a, a bit of a big jigsaw puzzle, Lego sort of piece on site. Um, and you just use those skilled trades on what they're good at and, and specialise at rather than, uh, you know, um, chopping out some plasterboard to fit a fast fix box and then put a bit of uh, trunking down the wall. I think my, my first 13 years of my career in, in design and in detail design, working with a contractor, I'm really passionate about getting that right. If you can, if you can combine a project engineer, project manager's brain with a design brain, and you can create a stage five set of drawings where those two guys have come together early enough and get it done before you start on site, you've got a really good chance of having a very, very productive site. If you combine that with what an integrated main contractor brings, where they do that engineering establishment set up on site. So they, you know, where I said they spray where the light fittings are going, they spray on the floor where the sprinkler head goes. So they just laser up. Everybody knows what they're installing, when they're installing, where they're installing to. There's How nobody many? walking around scratching their head. There's nobody walking around saying, where's the data line? You know, where's the ceiling line? It's all mapped out before you go in there. That is the way that you will get a more productive job and you will get a better quality job. And what about net zero and renewables and energy efficiency? So there's two projects I've, I've been involved with um, in uh, in the last in the last 24 months that have come to market with um, boilers and CHP still in their office blocks and apartments. Um, and, and we've gone through a process of value engineering and, um, and whilst it's value engineering, um, you know, we, we sometimes get a bad name for value engineering because we, we try and, and, and get, bring as much saving as possible. And that's because clients' budgets are, are stretched. But um, we've actually said you're in real great danger here of creating a building that's out of date before you've even started building it. And uh, one example was a customer that, that had um, offices and apartments on, on top. It was four by fan core unit, um, uh, LTHW boilers. And a government agency, we were going through a PCSA uh, agreement. So we were going through a, a bit of a design and, and costing exercise under a contractual agreement. And a government agency approached the developer to say, we're interested in your building and we can assure this thing as one of three, because we'd like to take a number of floors in Birmingham city centre. And subsequently they chose not to take that building because of the fact that it was gas fired you know, boilers in there. And, and there was a there was a stark reality then from the client. I, I did a presentation on net zero and a presentation on, this is what we think you, you should be doing to this building. We should be, you know, spend some more money on design, get it, get it, get it from scratch, go back to stage two, use air source heat pumps, you know, use use all electric um, and change that configuration. Um, we can save money in the process um, in, in doing so as well, um, but you will, you will have a far more attractive building on your hands than what you currently got to that, to that lease market. And uh, operating less, uh, more efficiently at, at less cost, presumably. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, and I and I think you, you know they certainly certainly the one job recently you know they it's been hanging around for a long time this project has it probably started 
um, uh, in the market over 10 years ago as an opportunity by, by Selfridges. Um, and, and it got to the point where the design and the planning had just been rolled on and rolled on and rolled on and rolled on. And then we were we were having a conversation the other day about, hang on, let's change this to electric. Let's go VRF in the office block. Let's go electric in the apartments above. Um, and uh, you were looking then back at the planning and thinking, well, hang on, it, it, this pl planning in 2013 when it was approved, it did a lot using electricity. And you almost got to renegotiate back with the planners to say, well, we want to flip this but we want to go for another planning submission now. So it does have implications, but you know, you know, you've got to actually put your hand on your heart and say, is it the right thing to do to put to put you know three megawatts worth of boilers and, and a CHP in? You know? No, it's morally wrong. So you, you've got to say with some conviction whilst you're looking for savings and you, you you know tell the client, spend a bit more money on design, let's go back to the drawing board, let's spend another 10, 16 weeks on, on revisiting it and, and you know, you will, you will have much better building at the end of it. It sounds like you've got a real passion for uh, uh, that overall uh, considered approach. Um, what, what gets you out of bed? What motivates you to uh, 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 do better each day? Uh, I think we have an obligation as an engineer um in in the industry we we have a, a an obligation to advise clients it's one of it's one of the criteria in in the in the same um uh, uh, competencies isn't it you know you need you need to, to have the conviction to put your hand up and say you do realize i know you've been designing this job for for five ten years mr client but you do realize that you're creating a very dirty asset you, you we owe it to them you know, there's, there's people out there that don't, still don't know what, what net zero really means, I, I think. And, and there's probably a lot of engineers that don't, don't know, um, building services engineers that still don't fully know. If you, if, if, I bet you if you asked 10 people, you get, you'd get 10 different definitions of what yeah, it really I'm, means. At, at the moment, I think uh, that net zero piece, a lot of people just think that it's let's throw some photovoltaic panels on the roof or solar panels on the roof for the domestic hot water and that will then offset all of our sins um, and be perfect for, for the future. But uh, as you say, that that net zero piece isn't just about uh, building the building or operating the building, it's about deconstructing the building as well. It's that whole life piece uh, and the embodied carbon where you've got some plastic GRP pods or metal pods coming from a location, being built in a location, then transported to site. And then when it comes to, to demolish that building, it it's, uh, needs to be recycled as much as possible. Um, and yeah, that, that net zero piece is a industry wide thing, not just an M&E building services thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, if you look at the government white papers now and they're saying, no dwelling, no new dwelling will have a gas supply by 2025. If that doesn't make you realise that the gases are depleting, um, a, a, you know, commodity, then uh, and, and we've got to move away from it. Then, then gosh, you know, it, so, something needs to to bring the light bulbs on. But but then, if you look at the air source heat pump market, there isn't anywhere near enough people in that manufacturing space. We need more and more air source heat pumps being made. You know, think about all the dwellings that, that are out there, all the houses that are out there that are going to eventually convert from from gas to air source. You know, just just in terms of, of of people going electric on cars. You know, you know, just getting the additional power supplies in terraced houses, semi detached houses that may share electrical infrastructure. There's there's a massive challenge for 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 us as building service engineers, not just in commercial buildings, but in domestic as well. Yeah, and, and that's the challenge and that's the excitement and, and that's where, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the challenge comes as, as engineers, as problem solvers, we uh, sort of enjoy um, responding to those challenges. I think the, the kudos of, of a building services engineer has, has changed massively from when I came into the industry. You know, we were, we were probably an annoyance to architects, where we probably still are, but annoyance to architects with you know, needing too much plant space and too much riser space, but we're now fundamentally in facade engineering and, you know, in terms of, of net zero, the kudos of building services has, has rocketed up. 
yeah. in, 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 in importance. Yeah. Your facades, facades now, you know, when you're doing a trade-off with, with, with developing a facade, that, that, is a, that is an art in itself, getting the facade right. You know, we've, we've almost created a position now where we've, we've gone so thermally efficient and, and we want lots of glass because we want lots of natural light that, that we've created the, the converse problem by overheating. Yeah. Spaces in the summer, you know, with the temperatures going up and retention of heat in a building, we've 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 almost created another problem in, in summertime, haven't we? Probably yeah. So and, so airtime, so thermally efficient. Yeah, and obviously you need that uh, ventilation air for um, uh, to live with and and to uh, remove any you know burnt toast smells or uh, you know meals from from the night before but presumably on on the building that you mentioned there's a whole load of filtration at the lower levels presumably at least for uh, vehicle emissions not getting into the building and purifying and cleaning and scrubbing that air before it gets into the occupied areas um but um yeah it's it, it's uh, an interesting challenge because the the solution at ground floor level isn't necessarily the same as the solution at 40 49th floor level well no nobody wants a, a fully openable window in a building that's 49 stories high for obvious reasons you know safety wise my god so they're very very limited those openings so the, the model the model gets done and, and dictates what we do in terms of air changes we're, we're oversizing mvhrs to get the to get them room to get them down and to get the noise the noise down on on, on there um but in in terms of purge you know you still got to have that that purge facility you know there's still there's still the time when somebody goes out for the day and comes home on a summer's day at five o'clock and it's been shut up all day with the sun shining through the window and it will be really uncomfortable yeah in in there um and, and we've got to be acutely aware of that the quality of life in these spaces needs to be needs to be right but, but also the the moisture in the bathrooms and the shower rooms and the wet rooms and, and those sorts of functions. Uh, and yeah, as you say, uh, bigger windows means greater heat gain, means greater elevated temperatures within the space, but with the view um, and uh, yeah, getting rid of, uh, you know, uh, we, we see in the news at the moment, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, articles about uh, asthma and uh, mold and, and various other spores uh, and COVID as well, you know, uh, common cold going around at the moment but um uh yeah th th there's certainly a, a lot of challenges there for building services and engineers in in uh, in the industry but uh, where do you see the industry going next um i think building services is going to it's going to remain um vitally important in in construction you know i think the um there's still a hell of a lot of mileage in terms of prefabrication going going forward. I think it's it's still talked about too much, but not implemented enough. Um, I think there's a there's a there's a myth that people think that prefabrication is going to is going to be cheaper. It, it, it invariably isn't, um, and it does cost more. But it, but the end product product is better. Um, I think the industry uh, over the next few years, we're certainly not seeing any signs of a slowdown um, right now. Um, we're always pretty late to, to see that. You know, the professionals um, normally see it first before we do as, as constructors. But um, I, I can just see things getting tighter and tighter in terms of, of energy efficiency. Um, for for sure, you know we've we've all got our part to play, haven't we, in in the emissions of the country, and and the government will be behind it and driving it, and that will make building services engineers even more important. And uh, you see that uh, piece, the the future and and the challenge for building services engineers as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, there, there's there's always new things that come that come to the market, isn't there? There's always new products, new innovation, you know, we're, we're, I was looking at the, the new air unit, uh, the NVHR the other day, and, and there's a cooling box edition that's on, on top of that that can peak lock. So, you know, even if you're looking at designing and future proofing on your TM59 for, for 2050, uh, there's ways of doing that now. And, and who knows what's going to be around the corner in, in two or three years time in, in that respect. 
those those supply chain, uh, they're, they're vital in all this. They need to keep pushing the boundaries to find you know, new innovation to 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 offset global warming. Um, because we can control it in as much as we can by going net zero, but you know, there's only so far that we may be able to go. Yeah, yeah, really uh, interesting uh, challenges uh, in the future. But uh, um, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing what you have. Just a couple of last questions, if I may. Um, yeah. What do you like to do in your spare time? Oh, I'm a, I'm a family man, uh, just so, you know, I, I love nothing more than to, to get the family around on a, on a Sunday, cook a good Sunday dinner. Uh, I've got a son that's a, a designer in the industry. I've got a daughter that's in facilities management. My wife sits there bored to death and we talk about chillers and boilers on, uh, over, a, over a beef and Yorkshire pudding. So uh, it's quite it's quite interesting, you know, 27 year old, 24 year old children that are also associated with the industry. One 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 designs, one maintains, and one constructs in the middle. Good. So cradle uh, to grave, we, as you say. We, yeah, we have some we have some fascinating conversations, but uh, it bores my wife to tears. But uh, that that's that's what that's what I I love, and I, and this industry to me. You know, some, when some people say, oh, your, your kids are, uh, are in the industry, why, why did you do that? And, well, it hasn't been bad for me. I, I, I love it. You know, I, I feel so proud when you walk around and you can point to buildings in the middle and say, I was working on that, I was working on that. And I did that in 19, 1998. And it, yeah. it, it gives you a real sense of pride. Yeah. So I have no hesitation about recommending building services or construction industry or effect to, to the family. Good. Uh, and uh, beef's the uh, roast of choice in the Heitman household, is it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And uh, lastly, where can people discover more about you? Um, on, on LinkedIn, I'm a, quite a private person uh, in, in terms of social media, but um, uh, you know, on, on LinkedIn, I'll, I'll do the occasional post on on there. If anybody wants to private message me, then then they can feel free. I'm, I'm more than happy. I'm I'm quite passionate about sharing the lessons learned. You know, I spent I spent a couple of years in London on a on a 34 story building, um, and and that was the the two toughest years of my working career. Um, I've done some CPD presentations on that sort of stuff, you know, which, in, which, which we're hoping to uh, do something yeah. on in the region together as well yeah. in the in the near future, hopefully. Yeah, and and you know, one one man's scars uh, you can you can pass on to another man's learning. It's insane if we keep doing the same thing as an industry. It doesn't matter whether you're competitors or or in the same organisation. We you know we could do a whole lot better at sharing that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, that that uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome, isn't it? You know, but uh, as I said previously, thank you very much for joining and sharing with us what you have today. Uh, if anybody watching or listening would like to share their thoughts with us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if you'd like to feature in a future episode or know of or could think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you, please get in touch. Uh, Gary, thank you very much for today. Please, uh, um, anybody listening, like, comment and share. And we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Region Vlog and Podcast. Gary, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Much appreciated.